Okay, this is the Latin America Politics and Economics Google Slides. In this presentation, we're going to go over location, region, movement, government, human interaction with the environment, some tourist spots, historical events, environmental issues, and so much more. So let's get started with beautiful Latin America. So let's first review its relative location. It is uh, north of Antarctica. So Antarctica is located down here, south of the United States, east of the Pacific Ocean, and west of the Atlantic Ocean. So you should see those landmarks here and here and here and, of course, down here. So we're talking about this big region right here. Within this one big region, we have three other smaller regions. Now, what makes South America and Central America and the Caribbean a region? It's really defined by its language and the influence of Latin languages, culture, and history. So let's talk about these three regions. We have Central America right here, the Caribbean right here, and, oopsies, and we have South America right here. So let's review the countries of Latin America. So in this first region, we have Central America. And Central America is Mexico all the way down through Panama, all the way here. So that is Central America. And these countries include Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. We also have the islands of the Greater Antilles, and those islands are here. Now, for the presentation, we're only going to cover the Greater Antilles, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. Now, we have the Bahamas that are located up here, and we have the Lesser Antilles that are located down here. And these are smaller, teeny tiny islands, and there's a whole bunch um, in these two different archipelagos. Uh, but we're only gonna cover, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, the Greater Antilles. Uh, South America is our last region that we're gonna talk about, and that is this whole continent all the way here. You're looking at Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. These are the countries of South America. Let's erase all of that. So let's talk about some of these mega cities. So now that we've reviewed the region and the different countries in each region, let's look at some of these cities. There are six mega cities in Latin America, and a mega city is defined as a very large population, typically over 10 million people. So you can look at these mega cities that include Sao Paulo, Mexico City with over 20 million people, Buenos Aires in Argentina, which is close to 15 million, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, which is a little bit shy of 15 million, and Bogota in Colombia, and Lima in Peru, which is both of them are a little over 10 million. Now, this is just their city proper. Uh, so if I went in to find these statistics, and again, I got this, look at my source at the bottom, the United Nations, uh, and I looked at the city and the surrounding areas, right? The megalopolises. Uh, megalopolis is a mega city that swallows up other cities in its region. These numbers would be dramatically higher uh, by millions, but this is just the city proper. So just within the city limits. Now, when looking at these megacities, you should ask yourself, why do some cities grow into megacities? And something that these cities have in common is access to uh, resources. So you have access to uh, fresh water, either um, a large lake, if you're looking at you know, Mexico City, you have access to um, the coastline, if you're talking about Rio de Janeiro or Lima, Peru. So if you have access to trade, uh, water, 
uh, areas where you can grow crops, which then um, eventually can spring into you know, larger cities, you're typically going to have a city grow over decades into a mega city. So let's look at one of these mega cities. Let's look at Lima, Peru. And you can see from this image here, right, its location right here on the coast. So Lima is the capital of Peru. It's a commercial and industrial center. And Limenos make four fifths of the country's consumer purchases each year. So the people in Lima, the people who live in Lima, make up four fifths of the country's consumer purchases, which basically means that there's a heavy concentration of wealth within the city. Uh, the city is wealthy. You can look at these images here and you can see the beautiful fountain, the beautiful uh, city square. You can uh, look in this image right here and you can see sky rises and apartment buildings, uh, a major tourist center as well. However, if you go outside of the city center, you have a little bit higher uh, rates of poverty. And we'll explore that in this presentation. So let's talk about the Panama Canal because movement is a a uh, big reason why you have a lot of these cities built up and become industrial centers. For example, Lima, Peru uh, traded uh, a lot on the Pacific coast. And so they can uh, trade from the Pacific coast into Central and Middle America and then trade to the West coast of the United States. And that's how they grew. Now, until that's how they grew until the Panama Canal was built. Now, when the Panama Canal was built, Lima could use the canal to trade with the eastern side of uh, South America easier. They could trade with the eastern side of Middle America and also the eastern side of the United States um, a lot easier and also navigate to Europe a lot quicker. So the Panama Canal was built, uh, if you look down here, bullet point three, between 1904 and 1914. But before that, France attempted to build the canal in the 1800s, but they experienced a really high mortality rate. You're looking at tens of thousands of people died, mainly because of yellow fever due to the growth of the mosquito. You have these, you know, this high um, swampy, marshy areas near uh, the big lake that they were um, excavating near the canal to build the canal. And mosquitoes just you know, grow and fester in that area. And so America said, we can build this canal. So France left, America stepped in. And there's a long story between America stepping in to build this canal. Uh, Colombia took over the territory of Panama. Teddy Roosevelt as president at this time period instigated a proxy war between Panama and Colombia, a war which later President Woodrow Wilson apologized for. Um, we basically supplied the Panamanians with weapons and said, go fight the Colombians. They won. And as a thank you, the Panamanians allowed America to purchase the land for building the canal. So Americans got down to business. Teddy Roosevelt didn't even ask Congress if he had authorization to build this canal. Instead, he just built it and said, I'll build the canal. You debate about if the canal should be be built. And meanwhile, you know, what are you gonna do after it's built? What are you gonna say, take it down? So uh, we built the canal in, or America built the canal really quickly in a 10 year period. And we did so with uh, very few deaths comparatively to the French. And that's mainly because we had a sanitation officer that really looked at this problems of the mosquitoes and yellow fever and said, okay, we need to be very dig digilant, um, vigilant about this. We need to drain pools of standing water uh, and make sure that mosquitoes aren't allowed to grow and hatch. So because of that, we built the canal in a 10-year period, 1904 to 1914, opened just a few weeks shy of World War I, and America controlled the canal from 1914 until it was transferred over to Panama in 1999. Between 1914 and 1999, there were some geopolitical issues. Panama didn't like being split completely as a country, um, you know, geographically speaking, uh, especially when they didn't get to benefit from um, the economics of the canal. 
So you can see here with this isthmus, right? An isthmus is a skinny strip of land separated by two bodies of water, Pacific Ocean on one side, and you have the Atlantic Ocean here. And we have this big lake that existed in Panama. So all we had to do is use dynamite, explode land from here and here, and also change the elevation a bit. And so we were able to um, use explosives, dynamite through that, set up a series of locks um, in order for a ship to you know, come in through the Pacific. It raises the elevation of the boat like this by flooding different chambers of water. And then when it goes back down, the water is released. So the water is released from a chamber and the boat goes down and goes forward. And the water is released from the chamber, boat goes down and it's there. And so it's, and that is a very long process, uh, but that is able to get um, the boats through the canal. So let's talk about some facts and figures. So when you're understanding this big picture of the cost of the canal and the manpower of the canal and how it basically transformed Latin America, it's really important to look at some statistics. Number one, the cost, $750 million, including the cost of the canal. Uh, and that's in 1914 money. So it was an incredibly expensive project. But it's worth it, specifically when you look at these two following statistics. Um, the average toll passing through the canal is $150,000. And the toll is dependent on you know, weight and size of the ship. And on September of 2010, the one millionth ship passed through the canal. So it was a way to create jobs for the Panamanians um, through the uh, for the Caribbean, the people in the Caribbean and South Americans who all flocked to Panama in order to get uh, jobs in this canal because on average 6,000 workers construct the canal per day, but it was also a really big money maker for uh, America who can control the canal for a large part of the 20th century. Now I had mentioned that there were deaths, but not as many compared to um, when the French constructed the canal, you're looking at 5,600 deaths. Um, some are due to yellow fever and disease because you have 6,000 people working um, in tightly confined areas um, in swamp-like conditions. You're definitely going to have disease spread. But most of uh, those deaths are because it was incredibly dangerous work. You know, people have to um, use dynamite and explosives. And one of the most dangerous jobs was lighting the dynamite. And of course, you have a very long wick to um, have the person who lit the dynamite, you know, go away. But then if the wick, you know, goes out, you're going to have to go and relight the wick. And again, you're looking at explosions. So it's a fairly dangerous job. Um, movement. So still staying on this theme of movement, but transitioning to migration issues when it comes to movement. I had mentioned earlier that during the construction of the Pan Can Panama Canal, you have a lot of people from the Caribbean flocking to Panama and a lot of people from South America and Central America flocking to Panama in order to get one of those jobs. Fast, fast forward to uh, the modern era, you have migration issues in Latin America, and you could see that looking at the special purpose map. So we have this key here, and we can see throughout South America mainly, you don't have too many people living, leaving these South American countries. But you can go into, you know, you see uh, Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Guyana, um, El Salvador, you have three people per 1,000 and up are leaving that country and migrating to another country. Uh, 2.1 to 2.9 people per 1,000 people are leaving Peru, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Guatemala. Um, next on the list, you know, one to two people per 1,000, Mexico, Honduras, Venezuela. So why are people leaving Latin America and where are they going? So the first is gang violence, uh, sorry, the first is government corruption. And this is something that a lot of Latin American countries suffer from, government corruption. Uh, this is an article about uh, the president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, and his corrupt government. 
from this article here, you can see I have this quote, 19 governors posed with Peña Nieto um, on, in his inauguration day. So these are his 19 politicians that are you know, part of his political party that stand by him. And um, since the election, uh, right here you have um, this picture from 2018, since this election, you have 10 have fallen out of foul for you know, breaking the law, bribery, diversion of resources, collusion with organized crime. Um, several are already in jail. So this is a problem in several Latin American countries, not just Mexico, but you have government corruption in Venezuela. You have government corruption in um, El Salvador as well. Another issue is climate change. So Latin America mainly falls within the tropical zone. However, as temperatures are rising, this is driving people specifically in El Salvador here, uh, driving them out of the country. So if I'm a farmer in El Salvador, uh, growing on a you know, subsistence farm, a farm that really feeds my family, or even a farm that you know, pays me and I sell my crops to, if I can't grow crops and it's unreliable, like this PBS article mentions, because the climate is changing, because the temperatures are too hot or the hurricanes are growing more intense, then that is going to cause me to, to leave. If I cannot feed my family, if I have no access to a job or income, I am going to leave. The last thing to mention is gang violence. So uh, this report from February of 2020 uh, from the United Nations uh, recalls gang violence. It says, quote, the report recalls the obligations of the Haitian state to end the cycle of violence by arresting, prosecuting, investigating alleged perpetrators of human rights, violence, and abuses. Without a proper process of accountability, the cycle of violence is likely to result in more victims. So again, this is kind of a cycle. You have uh, people are out of work, um, the farming or um, working in a factory that might close down um, leaves a high unemployment rate. You don't have a job, you can't feed your family, you're going to, a lot of people are looking to um, the drug trade. Drug trade grows gangs, gang violence, and people um, are recruiting other people and forcing people in um, Haiti, in El Salvador, in Guatemala to join these gangs. The government, which is corrupt and profiting off of uh, the drug trade, are then turning a blind eye to the gang violence. And again, all of this kind of cycle works together and results in people moving out of the country. So let's look at a few countries um, in this region. More details. So there's Cuba. Uh, and so let's look at the Cuban economy first. So the average Cuban earns $12,300 a year, and mainly the industries are petroleum, sugar, and tobacco. Petroleum, mainly because this region here in the Gulf of Mexico, um, even Mexico itself, um, in Latin America, they have a, there's a lot of oil resources there. So petroleum is a major industry. And again, you're located in this tropical zone. So you're going to have nice, hot weather pretty much year round. And those that's perfect climate for growing sugar and tobacco. Let's look at its society now. So society, mainly Christian. And this is because Cuba is a former Spanish colony and um, Spain is a is a Catholic country. However, since Cuba became a communist country in 1955, you start to see a decrease in um, people identifying with Christianity or Catholicism as a region, and more and more people identifying with no region religion. Life expectancy is pretty high. It's almost 80. But look at their physician density. It's incredibly high, 8.3 doctors per 1,000 people. That's really high. And that's mainly because Cuba has socialized medicine. Um, everyone has access to equal health care and the government funds this health care. So despite the fact that you have a little bit of a lower per capita income, you're going to have the high life expectancy and the high physician density because of Cuba's prioritization for health care. Now, let's talk about politics. 16 years universal suffrage. So that means you can vote 16 and up, which makes it seem like Cuba is a very free country, but they are a communist country, which means the state 
or the country government plans and controls the economy. A single party holds power, and that would be the Communist Party, and they impose it with the elimination of private ownership of property. So in Cuba, you cannot own um, anything. The government or the state owns everything, and the government and the state can regulate 100% of business, uh, which is why they're able to regulate the healthcare industry. So you don't really have a whole bunch of... Um, political rights. So yes, you can vote at 16. However, you vote for a member of the National Assembly. And then the National Assembly votes for who the president is going to be. So you don't have too many freedoms. In addition to that, in order to run for a government post, you have to be identified as a communist and be a member of the Communist Party. So you don't have a ton of political freedoms and government options in Cuba. Let's look at Argentina. So there's Argentina. Uh, the per capita income is twice that of Cuba, almost twice. You're looking at $20,000 on average. Some of their major industries, food processing, they grow a lot of soy um, in Argentina and a lot of corn. And those are um, good products uh, if you have processed food. You're going to find soy in corn or corn syrup in a variety of foods. Uh, religion. Catholic, 92%. Like I said, just like Cuba, that is a leftover or a remnant from uh, the Spanish um, colonizing uh, Latin America. They have a pretty high life expectancy too, looking at 77.8 years and a pretty good physician density as well, about four doctors per 1,000. Now looking at their politics, suffrage and voting, 18 to 70 years old has universal and compulsory voting, which means you have to vote. You're 20, you're 50, here's a ballot, you are voting. What's really interesting is looking at 16 to 17. That's optional, but only for national elections. Now, I don't want you to look at this and think that grandma doesn't get a right to vote. Great grandpa doesn't get a right to vote because he's 80. 80 year olds can vote, they just don't have to vote. It's not compulsory. And they have a presidential republic. So if you're gonna compare Argentina to Cuba, Argentina, has Argentina has a uh, higher per capita income. Uh, they have a diversified economy with food processing, but also industrialization with motor vehicles. They have a stronger or uh, more participatory um, religious group. Uh, their life expectancy is about the same. They have about half as many doctors and you're looking at, you know, similar in the fact that you have 16 year olds that have the right to vote, but you have a lot more freedoms in the fact that they have a presidential republic. So let's look at some income. So we had looked at income already with Cuba and Argentina. So let's look at a few other incomes here. You have Bolivia. So here's this 10,000 mark right here. So Bolivia is earning, I would say that's about $8,000 a year. And then you go all the way up to Panama and Panama looks like they're earning about, you know, $26,000 a year. So why do we have this big difference? Why do we have, you know, Mexico a little shy of 20,000, Panama 26, Guatemala a little bit over Brazil. I'm oh, sorry, a little bit over Bolivia. A few reasons why you might have different per capita incomes is access to resources, right? Panama, they have a major industry in the Panama Canal. Uh, a ton of jobs are available. A ton of trade is available because it is centered right there in the canal because it is also an isthmus. You have a lot of trade. Uh, so Panama can collect all of those taxes and all those taxes can create jobs. Um, you have access to resources as well. Um, Mexico has a big oil industry. They also have a big manufacturing industry. But you also have to look at governments, right? Is the government distributing those resources equitably? Is the government focusing on education or healthcare? You might have great universities in Mexico and Brazil, but if you don't have high paying jobs, you're gonna experience a brain drain where those educated individuals are going to flee the country and then go to a country that has a higher per capita income or more job opportunities. So as far as what contributes to different per capita incomes, what type of government do they have? 
What type of economic system do they have? Right? In Cuba, the government controls the economic system. So um, is that similar to another country? Those are some reasons why you might experience different per capita incomes. Let's look at Haiti, especially since we're talking about economics and per capita incomes. Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, with about 60% of the population living below the poverty line. This does not mean that 60% of the population has to skip their daily latte and have it just once a week. No. These are people that have a hard time buying shoes. These are people that have a hard time sending their children to school because um, they have to work to subsidize the family because the average person in Haiti is only earning $1,200 a year or because mom or dad might be unemployed because unemployment is at 40%. So we're looking at a really, really poor country. And there's a few reasons why this happens. Number one, Haiti is, they are in a hurricane zone, right? So you have this hurricane that dramatically affected Haiti in the fall of 2016. Uh, they're in a fault zone. They had a massive earthquake in 2010. And so you would think, oh my goodness, let's have the world, let's help the World Bank, the United Nations um, get together and help Haiti out. The problem is when foreign aid does come into Haiti, if you have these corrupt governments, which Haiti has had from time to time, they abuse the aid, they take the money. We're talking about um, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been lost over the past decade because the government and corrupt uh, building contractors in Haiti take the money and they don't disperse it to the people. Then you have this severe drought and that's going to influence the ability to grow food. So you have these environmental issues, but you also have these geopolitical and economic issues as well that are just exacerbating um, what's happening to Haiti. So let's also talk um, about the human interaction with the environment, right? Because we had talked about with Haiti um, how natural disasters can affect an economy. So petroleum is a major product in Venezuela. They've been an oil producer since 1914, and 99% of their export earnings come from oil revenues. So you can look at this chart here that shows monthly Venezuela crude oil production 2000 to 2019. So you, it dips up, it dips down, and then whew, it crashes, it stabilizes a little bit more. But then if you're looking to 2020, it's starting to really dip down. So Venezuela depends on selling oil to the world in order to have their country be stable economically. And they have not been able to do that, right? Look at this chart, it is going down, down, down. So if Venezuela earns most of its export income from oil production, what does this chart reveal about Venezuela's economy? Basically, as they're not producing a ton of oil, they're not selling a ton of oil. So they're not making a lot of money. So Venezuela, is experiencing massive government uh, corruption with President Nicolas Maduro. Um, and in addition to that, you have a lot of people fleeing the country because they don't have economic opportunities. Uh, people in Venezuela are starving. People in Venezuela are protesting against the government. The government violently fights back against these protests. Um, they don't have free and fair elections there. They don't have a free press there as well. So when oil is doing well, like in the early 2000s, Venezuela was living a very, very good life. Um, however, ever since Nicolas Maduro has taken over, it has taken a dive and the economy of Venezuela has suffered as a result. So there are other options in Latin America um, to earn a really good income. So you do have oil, which is a major industry in Venezuela. Um, but in Latin America, and I mentioned this earlier, because it's located on the in the tropical zone, you have a ton of cash crops. Cash crops, keyword here, agricultural crops grown in large quantities and sold in large quantities. So this is, you're going to have you know, thousands of acres growing coffee, thousands of acres growing soy or potatoes or sugar. And all of these products can be grown in Latin America because of its nice hot weather. Now, hardier products like potatoes and quinoa, they grow 
um, in the higher elevation. So something that's really nice about Latin America is you do have the tropical zone, but you have so many different areas of high elevation and those uh, high elevation areas create vertical zonation where you can grow different crops like wheat, potatoes, quinoa. You can grow those at higher elevation. Um, you go even higher elevation. So we're talking about the you know, Sierra Madres in Mexico. We're talking about the Patagonia region. We're talking about the Brazilian highlands um, or even areas lower in the Andes. You can grow the potatoes, the quinoa, or you can um, have sheep or llamas and you can use uh, their meat um, or you can also use their hide in order to make, um, to grow your economy and use those products to sell. Now, another way that a lot of areas in the Latin America region grow their economy is through tourism. So the Dominican Republic, which is very interesting because that's the other half of Haiti, right? Um, you have the island of Hispaniola and it's cut in half and you have Haiti on one side and you have the Dominican Republic on the other. Uh, the Dominican Republic earns a lot of their money through tourism. In fact, they earned $7.7 .7 billion in 2009 on tourism alone. They have whale watching January through March. They have a carnival celebration in February. They have white sand beaches and warm Caribbean water and reefs. So this is a major tourist spot for South Americans, Latin Americans, Europeans, Americans, Canadians. Um, a lot of people go to the Dominican Republic to vacation. Another place they go to in the Caribbean is Jamaica. Uh, in Jamaica, they also have a high amount of ecotourism. And ecotourism is tourism directed towards exotic, often threatened natural environments intended to support conservation efforts and observe wildlife. So these are people that are going to hike. Uh, they are going to raft. Typically, they're... Um, carbon footprint is going to be a lot smaller. So when they are true eco-tourists, they're gonna go into the wildlife and explore it um, without damaging the wildlife. They're not going to typically take a big Jeep through the forest. Um, they're going to hike through the forest. And you can see here just the beautiful um, natural habitats of the Dominican Republic and Jamaica. Let's transition to population pyramids. So let's look at Ecuador's population. So here we have their population goes boop. It goes inward a little bit for males. Oh, and then, whoopsies. And then it goes inward a little bit for females. So it looks like their birth rate is on the decline. It looks like it's negative. And what's interesting about that is this is a sign of uh, a growing society. Um, the smaller the birth rate, the typical, typically the higher um, rate of development they have, because that typically means that females are having greater opportunity to go to school, greater opportunity to work outside of the home. So in less developed countries, you have a really high birth rate. Um, in Nigeria, for example, women experience 7.8 eight births in their lifetime on average. So some women are having babies for a good you know, decade or two, starting at the age of 15 or 16. And if they're having that high birth rate and they're starting that young, they're getting married young and they're not going to school. So you see with a declining birth rate, typically women are delaying marriage until uh, their 20s and that gives them fewer reproductive years. Let's talk about some historic events. Oops. Okay, so first, uh, Treaty of Tordesillas. So the Treaty of Tordesillas is a really important treaty for the history of Latin America. The Pope in uh, 1493 said, okay, you see this right here? This is going to be Portuguese territory uh, during colonization. And you can see that Brazil falls within this territory. So because of that, Brazil became a Portuguese colony and not a Spanish colony. So the Pope had to settle this argument between the Spanish um, and the Portuguese. And that's where um, he settled, drawing those um, lines of longitude. 
1519, you know, flashing forward a few decades, uh, we have the conquest of the Aztec and Incan empires. So the Inca are located right here, Aztec empire located right here, and you have these ruthless Spanish conquistadors. And a conquistador is this Spanish explorer slash conqueror who basically went from Spain into uh, Latin America and and they basically took what they wanted. Um, they killed anybody along the way. They took their gold. They took their resources. They forced a lot of the indigenous populations to um, Catholicism as well. Despite the fact that these conquistadors were pretty ruthless, disease is what was the major killer for um, the indigenous population. However, you see a few hundred years later, 300 years later, uh, you see uh, the fight for independence from Spain and from Portugal. So many Latin American countries look to form republics. Um, ironically enough, it really started with Haiti. Haiti um, in the early 1800s started this revolt against uh, France to gain their independence. And what's the ironic part is uh, they, as I mentioned, are the least developed and one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere, despite being the first to lead the way for independence. We have political movements change. By the time we get to 1953 to 1959, we have this Cuban revolution with Fidel Castro, um, and he led a revolution bringing communism to Cuba. Remember a few slides back when I was talking about communism. Um, the president in charge before that was Batista. America helped, we flash forward to 1898, or flash backwards, America helped Cuba gain their independence in the Spanish-American War. And from 1898 to 1955, we influenced Cuban politics. Now, Fidel Castro rose up and said, oh, no, 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 we cannot have America influence our government, our politics. And he led this revolution and that eventually brought communism to Cuba, but that and a few assassination attempts on him um, in the 1960s really soured the relationship between America and Cuba. And there is uh, no political or economic ties between um, America and Cuba, despite the fact that America controls Guantanamo Bay. Um, and that's a remnant of the Spanish-American War. So we talked about communism Let's talk a little bit about socialism. So socialism, um, the definition, it is a political and economic theory. So um, you can have a socialist government. Oh, sorry, you can have a socialist economy, but not necessarily a socialist government. And this uh, basically states that um, it advocates that the means of production, distribution and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. So what does that mean? In Venezuela, for example, the oil industry is nationalized. And that means that when the government of Venezuela profits off of the sale of oil, they take the money and they give it back to its citizens. But if the government is not making money off of oil um, like cur current day, then they don't have money to give back. Cuba, um, they're socialized. I had mentioned that they had socialized medicine. Um, they're a communist country as well, politically speaking, but the government controls all means of production. So you can't own a business there. The country owns the business and the profit gets divided um, among um, the population. Brazil, Ecuador, Chile, and Bolivia, they all have elements of socialism. Um, some examples of where you can have socialism in your government, medicine and healthcare, like in Cuba, where the government um, has, they control medicine, they control healthcare, um, they um, can set pharmaceutical prices, they can set the prices for um, seeing a doctor. In Cuba, uh, there are no prices, but some countries will set the price and say, okay, everything costs $5. You just had a hip replaced, $5. You need new glasses, $5. You had a heart attack, $5. Another way that some of these countries have socialism is by housing. The government builds the houses, they give the houses, they build um, the apartment complexes, or um, you know, sometimes uh, they're not called apartment complexes, but they build the housing complexes um, and, and people live there and the government owns it. Uh, and natural resources like Venezuela, the government owns all of the oil that is being produced and they distribute the oil profits to the population.
So let's take a closer look at um, Sao Paulo uh, and let's talk a look about the favelas. So a favela, keyword here, is a slum or shantytown located within or on the outskirts of the country's large cities. This is not a favela. This is Sao Paulo, uh, but the favela are the areas that live outside of that. So um, favelas basically started in Sao Paulo um, in the 1800s when um, a lot of the African population was kicked out of Sao Paulo. And they said, okay, you can't live within the city. Like, go, I'm taking over the city and I'm taking over the homes and you guys just have to live. But they weren't giving any jobs. They weren't giving, given any resources. So you have to remember that Latin America, the Caribbean, Middle America, South America, they have a high African population because um, there was slavery in Latin America for a huge chunk of the 15 and 16 and 1700s. Uh, so um, as slavery went away though, uh, you still have discrimination in housing. So um, uh, these grew when migrants and former slaves were pushed out of these major cities. They didn't have money to buy the land and they became squatters. And a squatter is someone who lives on lands that they don't own. But again, they had no choice. All, all of their resources were taken away from them. So they build these makeshift homes out of random wood, scraps, bricks, cinder blocks, anything that they can find. What's interesting about Sao Paulo is that 22% of the city's 6 million dwellers live in favelas. So let's look at what some of these favelas are going to look like. Because again, this right here is not a favela. So again, you have a nice, pretty developed city in Sao Paulo. However, you go to the outskirts of the city and you can see these homes are built just like one on top of the other. And it's really dangerous because since all of these homes are built on top of each other and they're on this hillside, right? Hopefully you can see that this is um, a hill. If there's any sort of natural disaster, you're going to have the favelas just fall down. Again, you can see the developed part of Sao Paulo, and then you can see the favelas. You can see the population density here versus here. And again, you can see kind of the outskirts, right? This part is the favela, and this is you know Sao Paulo proper, where you have in this apartment complex, you have all these little pools and tennis courts and pools and tennis courts, and it's it's beautiful and lovely. And then here you can see the favela side. So we're gonna show this little video. Oh, actually, I'm not gonna show that video. Okay, so rate of urbanization in Latin America. So from 1952 predicted to 2030, you can see the urban is black and the rural is this blue color. Uh, and gradually what is growing is urbanization. And what is decreasing is the amount of people living in rural areas. So after 1950, you could see that the urban rural divide, it flips, right? You have more people living in uh, more people living in rural areas and fewer people living in the urban area in 1950. And then boop, it flips. You have more people living in the urban area by 1990 and fewer people living in the rural area. Now by 2030, it's projected that a vast majority of the population is going to be living in urban areas. Uh, sociologists probably make this prediction by looking at patterns like this. You see how this kind of goes up nicely in this. They look at chunks, like let's look at this 40 year period, okay? Okay, then let's look at this um, 30 year period. And then let's like make a prediction based on looking at trends. Now, as you have more Latin America cities become more urban, as you have more Latin American cities and countries excavate the natural resources like petroleum on higher rates, you're going to have specific problems. And you see this mainly in Mexico City with pollution. Mexico City pollution is incredibly bad. First of all, Mexico City is a mega city. They have in its city proper 20 million people. Um, and that's 
causing a lot of pollution, but also its topography is creating problems. Mexico City is located on a large plateau. So remember you have plateau, but it's between two mountains. And so you have a lot of the pollution gets trapped within this valley here. And so that traps the pollution um, and it just kind of, again, exacerbates this problem. And this is really bad because people in Mexico City are losing their sense of smell. They're losing their sense of taste. You have higher rates of asthma um, and it's not uh, good or healthy for the citizens of Mexico City. So what is Mexico doing to work on this? Well, number one, they're preventing some vehicles from driving on certain days of the week. So if your license plate has this number or this letter, you cannot drive on Tuesdays, right? Get your work done beforehand. Um, they require specific industries to cut emissions. Um, and that is something that they are currently working on. And it's a long term plan. And they're also redesigning city buses to be more energy efficient. And they're working with private industry um, in Mexico and around the world in order to combat these solutions. You see, you know, uh, Chinese electric buses roll out across Latin America. Mexico City's extreme air pollution with everyone covering their face. So you can see just how polluted Mexico City is, right? Do you think that these solutions are enough if people, in order to move about the city, have to wear masks most of the time? So that is the presentation on economics and politics. If you have a question about my sources, here you go. You can look at my works. Have a great day.